Kinda. Can you guys give me a little bit more energy for my wife? Because she's going to be preaching your face off this morning, and I'm excited. So can you give me a warm welcome as we welcome Miss Julia Rice to the stage? Come on, baby girl. Hey. Go sit down. <laughs> I do love you. He scared me pretty bad today in the bathroom. I was not saying kind words this morning, so he's trying to make it up for it. My gosh, I'm a mess over here. My notes have spilled coffee, makeup, Zion's baby food all over him, my pen, my handwriting, the representation, I guess, of me a little bit. Um, I have coffee, spilled coffee on my white shirt. Wearing white, there's a, this natural law somewhere in the universe. The moment you wear white, everything is attracted to you. Does anyone else relate to that? The moment you put a pants or a shirt, it's guaranteed that you will spill something. Well, it's okay. That's all right. I got a baby, so I'll blame it on him. He t touches me with his dirty hands. All right. So the scripture for today, John 2, 1 through 11, and I think the verses will be behind me. Um, I pulled up the NIV version. It's not any special. It's just the first version that came up on Google search when I copied and pasted the ver verses to my page. I typically prefer to read scriptures through the Passion Translation. If you haven't checked that out, um, I highly encourage you to go back and forth between different interpret or um, interpretations of the scripture, but I do prefer um, Passion typically, but the NIV does pretty good too. Let me start my timer so I can keep track of how long I talk. I'm a teacher at heart. I always treat this like a classroom. I actually wish we were all sitting in the circle and having more of a conversation. Maybe one day uh, when I have more time, I'll come, come in this morning and rearrange the seating so we can have like a small group discussion type thing. Some of you introverts are terrified of that. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, read through the scripture and then get right to the message for today. So I'm going to go ahead and start with verse uh, 2. So this is Jesus changing water into wine, his very first miracle. On the third day, a wedding took place in, or at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman? Why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. I mean, she's just got that mother's intuition. She just knows what's up. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremoni ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Filled the jars with water, so they, filled them with the, so they filled them up to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. It's very interesting to note here, and I'm not too familiar with the Jewish culture, especially in terms of their weddings and how the ceremonies take place, but this is not the first day of the wedding. This is the third day of the celebration, and... He had them take the wine directly to the person in charge of the wedding. I wonder why that is. Why not just take out the wine and continue the party, like just start distributing? But he said, take it directly to the head of the ceremony. Those servants must have been terrified because for all they know, they're just carrying a bunch of jars of water straight to the person in charge of the ceremony. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. There is so much going on in these 11, 12 verses. You could focus on so many different 
characters in the story. You could focus on the miracle. If you break down the characters, you can focus on Mary being his mom, who perhaps, perhaps got impatient and pushed Jesus to do something he wasn't yet ready for. Or being his mom, knowing him best, she believed in him, had more faith in him than maybe he did at that particular time, and just told him, go do. Use that mother's wisdom. You could focus on the servants, how terrified they must have felt in the moment to be told to take out these jars that weren't even meant for wine, take them out to this person who was in charge of the wedding and be humiliated possibly in front of everyone when the master of the ceremonies tasted the water. You could focus on the actual miracle itself. The scripture doesn't note that Jesus had to say anything for the water to become wine. Did you notice that? He didn't say abracadabra or one of the Harry Potter spells. Like he didn't say whoopity boppity boo. He said nothing. He just told the servants to go and do that. You could focus on Jesus and what he must have felt in this moment. I love the interaction that he had with his mom. Uh, in the, I went back to the Passion Translation and read the, uh, this particular story. And I love once she you know, said to Jesus, they have no more wine, and then can you please make more? We need it. He replied, and here's what he said. This is how the, the Passion uh, Translation has it. My dear one, don't you understand that if I do this, it will change nothing for you, but it will change everything for me. My hour unveiling, of unveiling my power has not yet come. Don't you understand that if I do this, it, change, it changes everything for me? We could focus on Jesus in this situation. But that's a sermon for another day. Maybe someone else will cover it in the next month. I wanted to focus on something very specific. From the first time that I read these scriptures, I knew... Um, something jumped at me, and it kept eating at me for several weeks. And I, what, what is, why just this one particular statement that stood out to me? I couldn't place a, a, a finger on it. And then as I was reading through the verses again this week, trying to come up with how I wanted to tie this particular statement and build a sermon around it, this one word finally stood out to me. And it's such a small word. It's a three-letter word. And I was like, oh, that's it. And for you, it might be not a revelation whatsoever, but for me, it hit me hard. So I'll share that with you. I want to focus on the master of, this, uh, of the, the ceremony, I don't, he, this uh, religious figure who presides over the wedding. I want to focus on what he said. He said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best and now. I know that all of us in this room have heard countless messages on saving best for last. The best is yet to come. The, the message of the hope. Sometimes it's preached with the intention of, you know, Jesus returning. And so, so the best is yet to come. Uh, one day when, the mindset of uh, my, the distant future. I've heard sermons preached like that my whole life. So I knew that that wasn't it. That wasn't this new revelation that, like I said, kept getting my attention. I'm like, what is it about this statement? Saving best for last. That's, what, what does that mean? And then as I read through the verses, I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And I don't know if uh, you guys will be able to come back and go back and show it on the screen. Um, it's verse 10. That last statement, but you have saved the best, help me out, till when? Everybody say now. now. That's what stood out to me from this whole story, that word now. We shift our focus to the future a lot, missing out the now. And as I was talking to Corey this week, and I haven't listened to their podcast yet, he, 
That's exactly what they were covering on the, pod, on, the, on the podcast, too, and I just haven't listened to it. And the fact that it stood out to me from the verses, I, I knew that the power is there. And I know that there is a word from this message for one of you. And if it's just for one of you, then it's all worth it. Now, we're going to talk about the now. Have you ever felt like life doesn't have much to offer anymore? Are you disappointed by life? Do you feel stuck? Do you feel stuck in your body? Do you feel stuck in your circumstances? Are you experiencing the most difficult season of life? Do you feel like you have nothing to look forward to anymore? Have you felt like life has just passed you by and you're a bystander? Are you a victim? Do you feel unimportant? Invisible? Forgotten? Do you feel unloved? Unappreciated? Are you ashamed? Are you ashamed of your circumstances, of the choices, of who you feel you have become? Are you hiding in the closet? Do you feel invisible in life? And that's why when people speak of the future, and it gives you hope to look ahead, but then that leaves a gap, that leaves a huge hole in the now. If you always focus on the best is yet to come, sure, one day when. That's a fairy tale. That's not real life. What about the now? How are you feeling right now? How are you feeling in this moment? We all come in, we all look pretty. You guys all look pretty. But this is a mask. What is happening underneath? What is happening right now? I got coffee spilled all over me. This one drop right here that I keep feeling, just one little drop. It's taking over my entire attention of me in the now. Do you get where I'm going? The coffee drop doesn't matter. What matters is how I feel and what I believe right now. Are you disappointed and are you going through the hardest season of life and you feel like you cannot get much worse than that? The goal for today, for me, the message I want you to learn, possibly relearn, or be reminded of the greatest power that is still within you, that is still living inside of you. And this power, this power wants, desires to help you learn how to laugh again, how to experience joy again, this power wants to reignite the passion for life and for the mission that you have been entrusted with. Your most important work is still ahead of you. Your greatest contribution to life and to people around you is still in front of you. I want you to write that down. If you have a phone, it's got notes, app. If you're a good old write, kind of write notes down person like me, I want you to write this down. This is a requirement from a teacher to her class. Your greatest contribution, so you say my, my greatest contribution, my greatest work, my most important work, however you want to phrase that, is still in front of me. And then if you're a quick writer, you can also add Neither my age, education, or ability can prevent me from stepping 
out and accomplishing my mission. I was going a little slow because some of you were writing and I wanted you to have time. My greatest contribution is still ahead of me. My age, my ability, my education, that cannot prevent me from accomplishing my mission. But your lack of faith in yourself, your negative mindset, that is what's going to keep you grounded in the current circumstances that you are in. That is what is going to prevent you from being successful and carrying out the mission that Jesus has set in front of you. He has given you everything that you will ever need, but your lack of faith in who you are and your ability to do it, that is what is going to stall that progress. But Jesus said, your age, your education, social standing, that will not stop you because he has equipped you with everything that you need to carry out your mission in the now. Don't let that lack of faith to stop you. I wanted to tell you about this podcast. It's by Sharon McMahon, and she's a government and econ teacher like I was. Uh, she used to be a government and econ teacher, and now she runs her own podcast. And in this podcast, she interviewed um, a writer, Cynthia Covey Holler. She, this uh, writer, along with her dad, they co-authored a book. And she talked about the book in the podcast. And the title of the book is Living Life in Crescendo. Your most important work is always ahead of you. How fitting is the title of the book to the message and how we can connect to the story. Living life in crescendo, your most important work is always ahead of you. The podcast immediately took me to this message because your life's mission, your most important work has not been completed yet. So what is crescendo? What does that mean? It was a new term for me. It's a musical term. So I think I wrote, or I, had, I sent the definition. Yes, perfect. So read it along with me. So what is living in crescendo? Crescendo means the highest point reached in a progressive increase of intensity or gradually increasing in loudness. Everybody say loudness. Everybody say intensity. That's what crescendo is, increase of intensity. You, living life in crescendo, and I think I wrote that down too, living life in crescendo means to continually grow in contribution, learning, and influence. Continually growing in contribution, learning, and influence. That, it, that's why I keep bringing age into the conversation, because we are all different, at a different stage of life in this room. Some of us are older, some of us are much younger, but sometimes we can use age as an excuse to stop doing something. But crescendo mindset tells you, and I think this is the kingdom mindset, no matter who you are or what stage of life you're in, your life is slowly building on that crescendo, building on that intensity. Your contribution to people around you, it gets better and better and better progressively. That's the message of crescendo, living life in crescendo. Keep God's faithfulness at the forefront of your mind. When you are in the season of doubt, when you are questioning everything, keep God's faithfulness at the forefront of everything. You must remain hopeful about your future. Remain hopeful about your future because your greatest contribution is still ahead of you. Your greatest contribution is still ahead of you. If you feel like you've already done everything, mm-mm, mm-mm. Jesus is sending you on a mission. And there is a different, here's the thing. Your mission in life is not, a, it's not like a career. You don't build your mission like you build a career in which you then get replaced in. No, your mission is a journey to be discovered by you. 
You don't invent it. You don't create it. Jesus created you for good works. And he created good works ahead of time for you. So you, it's not a career. Your mission has been created for you to step out. It's an, it's an effortless thing. Building a career requires a lot of effort. Living out your mission should be an effortless thing because it's interwoven with who you are. It is a part of your DNA. No one can complete your mission except for you. And there is no such thing as less important than other when it comes to your mission. There is no such thing as more important or less important. My goodness, I wish I had Brit and Tania's voice so I could sing like them. That's a part of their mission is to sing out the kingdom, sing out God's DNA. And it, there's so much beauty in that. I have a different mission. It's not any less or more important. It is just mine. That's what it is. Your mission is just yours. So how do you grow in contribution, learning, and influence? On the podcast, the author gave advice. So I'm going to give it to you, okay? One, you have to contemplate what your purpose or mission is in life. And two, you have to identify specific ways you can serve others using your purpose and mission. Easy peasy, my mission here is done. I've told you what to do. I've stressed you out, I will go sit now. <laughs> so, but how in the world do you do that? That's so easy to say and then just move on. So I'm gonna walk you through an exercise because I am a teacher and I must do that. I am very sorry. And this is where I, I don't know if Tim is available to do it, to do the piano thing for me because I need to set the right tone for this conversation. Okay, so have your phones out because I will need you to be writing things down, okay? I have three questions that I'm gonna ask you. I want you to write down those three questions and I'm gonna walk you through an exercise. And then we'll be done. Question number one, what is my mission in life? What is my mission in life? I want it to be a comfortable moment. If you feel led to, close your eyes. Don't look around to the person who sits to the left or to the right or in front of you. Close your eyes if you need to. And let the Holy Spirit take you on this quick journey. I love doing this because this is real life. It's a process of realigning yourself. What is my mission in life? I can tell you that my mission in life is to be. I am to be. I am to be a comforter. I am to be a counselor. I am to be a safe person. I am to be the love of Christ. That is my mission. It is different from yours. I have asked God that question and he gave me the answer. What is your mission? Holy Spirit, in this moment, I know that you are dying to show your sons and daughters what their mission is. Help them rediscover what they're meant to do. In this moment, show them an image, give them a word. You don't hide things from us, but you do enjoy revealing them. That's the first question is, what is my mission in life? If you don't have a lot of resources, how about just going to your neighbor and helping them pull some weeds in their front yard? Sit down and have a conversation with them. If you have little kids,
learn how to be a non-judgmental listener and allow them to spa the space and time to just be little kids, be a safe person for them. Maybe that is your current mission. We all have different walks of life. The second question is how can I serve others while accomplishing this mission? You were created on purpose and for a purpose. How can I serve others while accomplishing this mission? That is the kingdom of God mindset. We don't walk all over people. With a career mindset, that's what happens. But a mission is not a career. How can I serve others while accomplishing this mission? And question number three, what choices can I make even if I can't choose all of my circumstances? What a powerful question. Can you keep it on there? What choices can I make even if I can't choose all of my circumstances? Sometimes we can have this interpretation of a person who stands on this stage, that they have it all figured out, that my life is beautiful and I am just this perfect person because I have a microphone. My goodness, that couldn't be far from the truth. What choices can I make even if I can choose all my circumstances? Let me tell you about some of the circumstances. My home country is in the middle of a war. Hundreds of thousands of people have died. That is outside of my control. If I were to draw a big circle, and I do this in counseling, if I were to draw a big circle, and you can do that in your notes app or on paper, on the outer edges inside of this circle, I want you to start naming all of the things that are outside of your control. This is a circle of chaos. Things that are happening to you or around you that you don't have control over. As I start naming some of mine, you think of yours. Mine would be, my goodness, war in Ukraine. Zion's health. He's over a year old and he can't even sit up on his own. This future election is inside of my circle of chaos, too. I love politics. What else is inside of my circle of chaos? Circle of concern. There was an earthquake in Turkey this past year. Wiped out close to like 100,000 people in 72 hours. There were other disaster, natural disasters that have happened in the world and they impact me so deeply. I don't have the words to describe how angry I get when I hear terrible news. That's inside of my circle of chaos. I don't get to control it. Now, inside of this big circle, inside the very in the middle i want you to draw to draw another circle in this smaller circle that is your circle of control that is your mission this is what you can impact what is inside of your circle of control in this moment my attitudes my beliefs my faith my love my time, that is inside of my circle of control. That is my mission, I am to be. Your circle of control inside is, will look different. It will have different things written down in it. I want you to reflect on this this week. I want you to walk with God, go through those three questions every day if you have time. Be intentional. 
Because as you begin contemplating the answers to those three questions, what is my mission, how can I serve others, and what choices can I make if I can't choose all my circumstances, as you begin to figure out the answers to those questions, you will naturally begin to grow in contribution, learning, and influence. Fulfilling your mission is how you contribute to God's kingdom. Write that down. Fulfilling your mission is how you contribute to God's kingdom. And don't forget this truth. Like the fine wine Jesus made for now, your best work is right in front of you. Your greatest accomplishments are still in front of you. So make a contribution in whatever capacity. Help continue expand God's peace, righteousness, and joy because that's the kingdom. And then follow Mary's advice. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Let me pray. Jesus, we will follow Mary's advice and we will do whatever you tell us to do. If we need to carry the jugs of water, we will do that. Your faithfulness never falters. Your identity never changes. Your promises, you never back away from your promises. Every promise is always fulfilled. And your promise to us, to your sons and daughters in this room, is that the best, your most important work that you have for us is still ahead of us. And when we think we've done that, there is something better that's next. That's who you are, Jesus. We love you. We thank you. That's in your name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I appreciate that. What a challenge, though, right? What a challenge to all of us to sit with those three questions. What is my mission? How do I continue in my mission while serving others? And then how do I continue to live when things are happening around me that are out of my control to still follow out the mission that God gave me? And really sitting in that, it's going to take a lot. I know I was sitting there thinking, wow, what's in front of me right now? But I think she summed it up. Answering those three questions really come with a question or the statement that Mary said, do whatever he tells you. And so as you're contemplating and thinking about what you would say to answer these questions, I, I want you to realize that God will speak, that the Spirit will speak. And as Julia was, was just preaching that, and as she kept going back to this word now, I couldn't help but think of how in, in Scripture, and you may already know this, but many of you may not, there are actually two words that mean word in scripture one is logos so when we see word of god and it's translated from the greek word logos it is the written word it's like words written on pages it's like the actual pages of our bible that we declare is the word of god but then there's another greek word for word when word of god is used and it's the word rhema Rhema isn't the written word, it is the spoken word. And as she was talking about this now moment of things that are right in front of us to accomplish, I couldn't help but think about that contrast between Logos and Rhema because in Ephesians chapter 6, when it's talking about this armor that we put on, the spiritual armor, it ends with this in Ephesians six seventeen. it says that, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And again, this Word of God right here, it's the Greek rendering rhema. And it means the spoken Word of God for, get this, now. And so as we attune to what the Spirit is saying, what God would have for us, we can get a right now word directly from him. And so, yes, it's a challenge to sit with those questions, but it's also amazing because of the 
unlimited potential that God is going to begin to show you and what you can walk out in front of you right now. And that's so good. Well, we're going to end the service. What I would like, um, maybe for those of you who might really just need some prayer about this area of mission, um, maybe you've thought about it. Maybe you, you've really wanted to hear from God and maybe you've wanted that, that rhema word, just a word in the moment right now. I'm going to actually ask you to just stay after the service. We're going to have just, uh, just a couple of people up here. Matter of fact, um, they don't even know I'm going to do this, but I'm going to ask Julia to stay. And if you just need prayer and for her to pray over your life, for the spirit to begin to speak and release things in your life for right now, she's going to pray and lay hands on you for that. And then I'm also going to ask uh, Brandon if you and Shai would come up because I know you guys hear from the spirit better than almost anyone I know and just release that into people's life and begin to speak a right now word over them. So if that's you and you want that, the three of them are going to be up here. But for the rest of us, make sure you make plans to be here next week as we run it back. John chapter 2 again. And honestly, Corey said, I don't even, he didn't know how to describe rewind. I don't even really know how to say that either. Like to wind a tape. <laughs> That's how you would do it. Wind a tape back up. But uh, play it back. We'll see you guys here next Sunday. Make sure you're here. And as you leave, just know you are loved and there's nothing you can do about it. So go connect someone to life this week. See you next Sunday.